thank you very much for the invitation to come today. It's been a joy, a real joy to be here. A real joy to see a full church too. <laughs> uh, wherever, sorry? In this day and age, right? Yeah, well, wherever I've been in the past few months, it's always been social distancing and there were a couple of, of pews that were marked off. So it's good to see a, a full church and I would like to affirm you and your work and the members for the work they do in this area. I know it can be difficult having worked at Isparan. It's not the easiest to work in the inner city. In the inner city, anywhere in the world is hard. But to see a full church in the inner city of Sydney next to Bondi Beach is a real joy on a Sabbath morning. So it is my joy, my privilege to be here today. We drove from Kurongbong, my wife and I, left quite early and then got lost on the way. <laughs> you know, different turns, took the wrong turns. And you know, we had the GPS in front of us, but you know, what can you do? You know, look at different things and took the different road. But fortunately we left early and were here on time. At times God answers in different ways. We came and we were looking for parking and we, thought we saw a two hour parking, we turned and as we turned, we saw that there was a parking that was not marked for any kind of time. Oh, we alive. You know? So I don't know if I'll have a big fine when I go back <laughs> or I'll be good, but I hope I'll be good. So thank you very much for the privilege of being here. Last year, I was with you on Zoom. This time, we are able to talk face to face. And we come at a time of great celebration and commemoration. It's a time of the Passover, the Pesha. And so I would like to, okay, you did warn me that it might work. <laughs> uh, I would like to wish you all a happy Passover, happy Pesha. The story of the Passover is monumental. If you are a Jew, a Christian, or any believer in the Word of God, there are those moments that you cannot miss in the Word of God. The creation, you cannot miss. The flood, you cannot miss. The exodus, you cannot miss. Later on, with the Babylonian captivity, coming out of the Babylonian captivity, the writers wrote in terms of the second exodus. And so if you're reading, as I am doing right now, the book of Isaiah, you will see the language of the second exodus coming through at many times. Interestingly, the Christian church and the Christian writers the writers of the New Testament will use the same words to remind us that the way that we are taking with Jesus, the way, of the, the way of the disciple is a new exodus from a world of sin to the promised land, the new Jerusalem. So the exodus and the Passover is monumental for whoever reads the Jewish Bible, whether you are a Jew, whether you're a Christian or just a diligent student of the word. The Passover story, however, is more than a story of liberation from slavery. It is more than a narration of what happened to slaves in their homes 3,000 years ago. It is more than the story of a nation of slaves that was waiting upon their deliverance. It is more than the story of eating roast lamb or goat and leavened bread and bitter herbs. It is more than the story of blood over the lintel. It is more than the story of removing leaven from homes. It is the story of the beginning of God's people. 
In the book of Genesis, we have the creation story. The creation of the world out of this cosmic chaos is the foundation of the book of Genesis. The foundation of the book of Exodus is that out of the chaos of slavery, the people of God were created. The story of the Passover is a story of salvation from slavery and shame. Safe, away from slavery and shame. On the Passover night, God's angel saved Israel, set them free, safe from slavery and shame, but sent Egypt into the shadows of shame and sorrow. I would like, I would have liked to be there at the Passover. You see, I come from the island of Mauritius. On the island of Mauritius, the 1st of January is a very important event. First and foremost, great men are born in January, and the greatest are born on the 1st of January. That's just a joke. I'm born on the 1st of January. <laughs> I'm born on the 1st of January. But for Mauritians, the 1st of January is very important. I can remember back in my mother's house, we clean the house for the 1st of January. You here have spring, spring cleaning. We used to clean the house for the 1st of January. So the house will get a new coat of paint in December. In the beginning of December, first week of December, all the curtains come down. So if you go in Mauritius on the, in the month of December, you'll think the people don't have curtains because the curtains all come down. And we're going to wash all the curtain. The curtains are washed. New clothes are being are bought. When I was small, we're not very, um, we weren't very rich. We couldn't go and buy clothes anytime. So we will have one set of clothes to wear throughout the year, every Sabbath, but we start on the 1st of January. So in December, go, we go to the tailor, and the tailor is very busy because the whole island is having their clothes, suit, pants, shirt made. We'll have our clothes made for the, for the next year. And the 1st of January is the first day when we will start wearing those, those clothes. The first of, for the 1st of January, we're going to go and wish family and friends Happy New Year. Beautiful curry will be served. Beautiful food will be served. The best, however, is that on the stroke of midnight, everyone gets to throw firecrackers around. It's like a whole bomb that falls on the island. Last time we were in Mauritius, I think it lasted for 15 minutes. 15 minutes of people, I mean, no health and safety here, but everybody just throwing uh, firecrackers. The, the kids were just throwing firecrackers. And so I bought, like, they called that the, the cannon firecrackers. You just, you just roll it out, and it just comes in, and it just, it's like the gift that keeps on giving. It rolls it out, rolls out, rolls out, and you light it up, and it just, like, you know, just bumps the whole place, you know. It's a big, big, massive noise. So the 31st of December is huge for us. The 1st of January is huge for us. I can only start to imagine, but not cannot fully fathom what Passover night would have been. The leaven was taken out of homes. The bread has been baked. The goat or the lamb has been killed. The blood has been paced 
on the lintel? The lamb or the goat has been roasted. The bitter herbs have been cooked. And there, standing, they were eating. As I said, I can start to imagine, but can't fully fathom the expectation of that night. But I can see three points that I would like to share with you about the Passover. The first thing, the Passover was a festive time. Liberation was coming. But a festive commemoration nested in adoration. The Passover was a time when people came, slaves came, waiting for salvation. And as they waited for salvation, they did an act of worship. They cut the lamb, they placed the blood on the lintel, and after that, they waited in expectation. So the first point is, the Passover is a commemoration nested in adoration. My second point is, the Passover, I think I need to go back a couple, the Passover is also a socio-political feast. It's not just religious. It's socio-political. It's liberation from, slaves, from slavery. The Passover reminds the people of God that God saved them from slavery. That God, for the first time, had heard about their suffering. That God has heard about the suffering and will now save them from the sins of the Egyptian. Later on in the book of Numbers, when the Passover is celebrated again, God saves them from their own sin. For the first time, you have God saving a people not from their sin, but from the sins of the, of the Egyptian. Important distinction because as we celebrate the Passover, a lot of us come here as victims. A lot of us have been victims of our, our circumstances. I am a victim of my circumstances, but I cannot stay victimized forever because whatever has victimized, victimized me, God saves me, renders me safe, and offers me salvation, even if it is from the sins of others. My second point. Third point that I can see from the Passover is that pa the Passover, the first Passover, was an act of worship in faith. Imagine if the Israelites cut the lamb, roasted the lamb, put the blood on the lintel, and yet the angel didn't come to deliver them. The next morning, the Egyptians would have ridiculed them. You were making a thousand bricks. Your God never came through for you. Now make two thousand. You know, you thought there was deliverance. No, you're going to be slaves forever. You, your children, and your children's children are going to be slaves here. They would love that over them. Yet, all the Jewish nation celebrated, prepared in faith of salvation. Really important thing. They ate it standing, belt fastened, sandals at their feet, staff in hand. It's a celebration before the event. It's like celebrating Anzac Day before Gallipoli happened. It never happens. 
It's like a country celebrating independence before receiving independence. The Passover is an act of faith. Now, as I reflected and I checked if it's appropriate for me to say those things with your pastor, I reflected and I thought to myself, living now 3,500 years thereabout after the first Passover, are we only here to commemorate an event, momentous might it be, that happened 3,500 years ago? Is that the only reason that we are here? It's an important, it's a great celebration, but are we here celebrating something looking back? And as I said to you before, my interest is the New Testament, has always been the New Testament. I joke with my Jewish friends and say that the Old Testament is a preamble to the Bible. It's a long preamble, but just a preamble to the Bible. Of course, they, I'm, I'm not very popular when I, when, when I say that to them. But then I ask myself, can I go into the New Testament and find something about the Passover that's relevant not only for people 3,000 years ago or relevant for people 2,000 years ago, but also relevant for us living in 2021. And there I come with a story well read by my friend here this morning about Jesus changing water into wine. Now, I don't know if I do have a quote from John Pauline. John Pauline says that one of the peculiarities of the Gospel of John is that whenever a feast is mentioned, the major characteristics of Jesus described in the narration tend to correspond to the major characteristics of the feast. And so as you read, as we read the story of Jesus changing water into wine, we realize that it was close to the Passover. John chapter 1, chapter 2, sorry, verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. If I take that point of John Pauline, I would say that the story of water change into wine must take me back to the Passover. In any case, every miracle in the book of John, there's only seven miracles in the book of John, takes us back to the Exodus. Changing water into wine reminds you of Moses changing water into blood. Uh, multiplication of bread reminds you of the locust plague where the locusts ate all the bread. Healing of a child reminds you of the souls that were brought to the Egyptians. Healing of the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the healing of the blind man when he sees the light reminds us of the darkness that was over e Egypt. Lazarus raised from the dead reminds us of the dead of the firstborn. So every miracle takes us back to the Exodus and every miracle in the Gospel of John is a way of saying the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus is a new exodus. So here we come with the Passover. It was the Passover and Jesus changed water into wine. Now, I think we know the story. I mean, it's one of the most popular stories of the Bible. Jesus changing water into wine. So popular that comedians such as Mr. Bean have come and made a joke about it. And the joke that he said that I still remember is, uh, do you do birthdays too? Of course, if in our midst there was somebody that could change water into wine, we, he would be the most popular person at any weddings, any festival, any birthday. I believe, I understand, that the wine here is grape juice. Okay? Even there, I think we'll, he'll be very pro popular if he can ch change water into grape juice. But here are a couple, of, couple points. I have 
probably just three points. The first point is there was no more wine. This point of having no more wine is emphatically placed in the Gospel of John. And you say to yourself, well, they have no more wine. Yeah, so what? They'll drink water. Having no more wine at a Jewish festival brings shame to the family. At a wedding, the village is expected to be invited for, wait for it, for seven days. Seven days festivals. Now, my wife and I know that in Mauritius we have three days, three days wedding. And you provide food for three days. And the people are coming by busloads to be able to eat. At times, we weren't invited to weddings, and people are saying, we're going to a wedding. Would you like to come with us? I say, we're not invited. I say, no, everybody's invited. You might end up with the whole island at your wedding, and you need to provide food <clears throat> for three days. There, it was a seven-day wedding. After a few days, I think it's in the third day, there was no more wine. Having no more wine meant that there would be shame attached to it. We live in a culture of guilt. The common saying is, uh, uh, who took the cookie from the cookie jar? You know, if I took the cookie, I feel guilty. I feel guilt. Guilt is a personal thing. Shame is a communal thing. How do people look at you? Depends on whether you are honorable or you are shameful. The woman at the well couldn't come at normal times to pick up her water because of society's shame. Honor and shame in the ancient Near East was what make you get up out of bed and what gave you a good day, what brought friends and favors for you. You invited me to come, a favor you've done to me. In the ancient Near East, you favor people that are honorable. You don't favor people that are shameful. So the concept of honor and shame is not just like guilt. Like today, if there is not enough food at a wedding, it's just broken pride. In those days, it is shame on you. Everywhere you would be walking in the village, and for those of you that had the privilege of going to Israel, I love traveling to Israel, I love the people, I love the food, you know, you would know that the villages weren't big. Capernaum it was not a big place. And so walking through Can Cana, everybody would look at them shamefully. How dare you have a wedding when you couldn't give us enough drink? So the first point is the shame factor. So at the wedding, Jesus saves a couple from the shame of that society. Second point, how much wine did Jesus make on the day? How much wine did he make? Now, my good book says that there were six jars. And every jar can contain 20 to 30 gallons of water. Now, I am not an American, and so I don't talk in gallons. I was glad to go to America and realize that one gallon of almond milk cost as much as one liter of almond milk here and realize that an, an, a gallon was much more than a liter. You know, I was loving drinking the almond milk in America, the gallons of al al almond milk. Now, one gallon is how many liters? Now, I can see all of you going on Google, checking. I can see, yes? Four point something? 
Okay? I like four. Sorry? 4.5. I like you even more. 4.5. Now, for what it's worth, Google told me 3.78541. Okay? For whatever it's worth, Google said 3.75. Uh, 78541, but I like 4, I like 4.5, I mean, like, hey, the more the merrier, you know? Now, 20 gallons gives me how many liters? Let's go with 4. Let's go with 4. 20 gallons gives me how many liters? 80. Let's go with 4.5. 20 gallons give me how many liters? 90. 30 gallons give me how many liters? Let's go with four. 120, 4.5? Five? five, yes, 145. Now, when I did my maths, 20 gallons gives me 75.7082 liters. 30 gallons gives me 113.562 liters. So Jesus, so how, much, how many did we get with you? <laughs> you know, on the day, Jesus changed more than 600 liters of water into wine. That's insanely a lot of water changed into wine. Would you agree? That's a lot of water change into wine. That's my second point. When Jesus gives, he gives abundantly. So the story of the water change into wine is a story of changing shame into honor. But not by just giving the bare minimum, but giving more abundantly. Jesus kept the party going in an abundant way. When Jesus gives, he gives more abundantly. John 10:10, 10, 10, where I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. There's this thing that puzzles me with a, the with a story, and that's my third point. If you are to be married, wouldn't you choose the best? You know, um, in December, I celebrated 25th wedding anniversary. My good wife wanted us to have good stuff. She wanted me to wear my best suit, not the one I'm wearing today. <laughs> she wanted us to go to a good restaurant to entertain our friends. Wanted the best decor. Isn't it true that on your wedding day, you really want the best? The gentleman here would have made sure that he could offer good wine to his guest. I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't go and get the cheapest wine on his wedding day. You never know, but I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Yet when Jesus turned water into wine, the very best that the groom could afford was not good enough for what Jesus could do. So whatever Jesus gave was not only good, but superior to good. So Jesus gives what is always superior. This is why I think that at the wedding of Cana, Jesus saved the couple from the sorrow 
and the shadows of shame and set them free from society's shame. At the Passover, God saved, spared, set free people that were in slavery, living in the shadows of shame and sorrow. At the Cana feast, Jesus saved from sorrow and the shadows of shame people that was bound for communal shame. Today, as we celebrate the Passover, as we celebrate Pesha, Jesus wants again to save us from sorrow and the shadow of shame and set us free. Remember two things. The first thing is that whatever Jesus is giving you, whatever Jesus is saving you from, he saves you more abundantly. Secondly, whatever Jesus gives you will always be better than your very best because he gave the good wine when the groom tried to give the best. So today, as we celebrate this momentous event in the life of the Jewish nation, let us remember that we not, not only look, look back, but we can look forward because Jesus saves us from the sorrow of sin and shame. God bless. Indeed, Lord, faith is a victory. And victory in Jesus means that you save us from sin and shame. That we are safe in the hands of Jesus. We pray that as we go our way, we can go because faith is our victory. Amen.